Hello, everybody. Welcome to Fridays at 5. That's kind of fun to have a Fridays at 5 session. Um, this is a free session that we offer regularly through our teacher community. Uh, if you go to learn.colorvowel.com, you will find the teacher's community. Um, if you're watching the recorded session, uh, visit us at colorvowel.com to learn about what we do. And we try to convey a lot of that here in this session. Um, joined today by Jennifer Campion. I want to say hello, Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer is always our go-to. Um, Jennifer is always reachable at customer support at colorval.com. And um, I'll tell you briefly who I am as well, as well as Jennifer here. There we go. Uh, today we're meeting to talk about insights for language program administrators. So if you're watching and you're a, let's say you're a teacher who talks a lot with their course administrator, um, or you are a program administrator, you run a program of some kind, uh, this is for you today, so welcome. Um, once again, I'm Karen Taylor. I'm Color Vowel uh, author and co-founder of English Language Training Solutions. And Jennifer is our business manager and our partner success manager and our everything operations manager. Um, so we're, we're glad to have Jennifer in the room with us today. Um, Color Vowel, when you hear that phrase, it, it represents a lot. Um, today, we're gonna be exploring it in detail. It refers to a comprehensive method for teaching spoken English. Um, it also refers to our experience of over 20 years uh, developing and testing these strategies and these tools. We've reached well over 20,000 teachers and millions of learners around the world through all of our strategic partnerships with organizations like Peace Corps and the United States Department of State um, and, and other smaller organizations that are visionary and doing work like visionary, uh, sorry, like the Washington Literacy Center here in Washington, DC, um, and Intercombio Uniting Communities in Colorado uh, with a national distribution. So very exciting what we've been doing. Um, we uh, would like to talk to you about your program. So let's settle in with some questions for you. Uh, what kind of program do you belong to? And I've, I've isolated this word program and highlighted it because now is where I can kind of calm down and get quiet. I love this word program. Um, what is a program, right? Is it just a collection of rooms where you offer classes? Um, is it for a particular group of people? Of course it is, right? Um, so I've got some folks here in the room, um, Doug and Joan. How would you describe your program? And do you see a label here that fits your program best? And I just ask you to go ahead and open your mics and let me know. Um, Doug, do any of these apply to you or do you want me to create another bullet point? Well, it's close. It's an adult uh, ESL program with unpaid instructors. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So actually, I'm going to take yeah. away. Let me see if uh. I can do this better for us. Um, I'm going to... Volunteer really, teachers, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to take away right now. I'm just going to take away all of the paid or unpaid stuff for a minute. Mm -hmm. Um, we'll just do this because I'll show you what I mean in a moment. Okay. So yours is an adult ESL program, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. And when we say adult ed, part of the reason I wanted to do this exercise is to share like what lights up when we hear some of these terms. Um, so adult ed might be run through, it might be run through a nonprofit, right? And I think that's yes. your case, right? Yes. Nonprofit. Yes. Great. So it can be both of these right? Mm -hmm. um, it might be an adult ESL program run through a faith-based program, through a church, for example, right? Mm -hmm. um, it could be adult ed run through a college, uh, community colleges in particular. Is that your case, Joan? Yes, um, exactly. Adult ed through a community college. Mm -hmm. Right. And so often that's when we see that a capital A, capital A, we're talking about uh, often community college, okay? I'll just put that there so that we're thinking about those terms. And that way, um, nonprofit usually refers to adult ed. These are usually adult ed. But again, we we like to talk about these terms because they're they're going to be very context specific. I'd like to welcome Verva to the room. Uh, glad to have you here. This is an open conversation, by the way. So we're building concept and exploring what makes a program a program, right? Um, how about Elizabeth? I know, um, I'm not sure if you can speak up, but I know you do a lot of work with kids and adults. What kind of program is that? 
so I, I'm part of a faith-based program and um, that we have adult ed at nights, but then we also have a camp for kids over the summer. And so this summer I worked with some of our new arrivals during that, and I'm branching to do more with those new arrivals. Um, yeah, I ran into one of them the other day, um, and she made very clear that using color vowel with me the little bit over the summer was more helpful than what she was getting at school. So <laughs> let's find a way to keep mm -hmm. getting together. Then. That's very exciting to hear because you did a lot of training with us in a very short a period of time. So you kind of went in with, with all of your tools ready to go and all your strategies. That's, that's super exciting. Okay. Um, is there anything else that anybody notices that I need to add? Jennifer, anybody? Verva, if you can turn on your mic, I'd love to hear uh, if any of these labels uh, apply to your program or if we need another one. So I am uh, with K-12 uh, school district and our um, high school and middle school staff have um, started to use co color vowels a little bit mm -hmm. to try it out. That's why I'm here, just to learn a little bit more. Wonderful. And if I could ask just a follow-up question, um, who first brought Colorville concepts to your school? Was it a teacher who then, uh, and are you an administrator? That's my other question. Um, yes, I'm the ELL program coordinator and uh, one of our teachers um, brought it back from a TESOL conference. Wonderful. And that's a very common pathway, by the way, uh, when we go to those conferences, you know, we, we reach a lot of people in a very short burst of time and then they go back and they find their program administrator, um, which is, again, why we're here today. So welcome, and thanks, Verva. Please mm -hmm. feel free to speak up and ask questions, okay? Great. Um, then I'm going to take this, and now we're going to come back to the question and the idea of Doug's reality. This is all very relevant to programness, by the way. <laughs> it's the question of the green items are about sort of is this a, a paid person or is this a volunteer person? And the implications are slightly different when you're running a program. Um, and, and so I just want to put that out there, you know, that you could combine any of these with paid volunteer teachers or literacy tutors, um, as is the case sometimes. Okay. Um, and then down below, I've just added in another factor, which is what kind of training do the teachers in your program typically have? And I'm sure I'm missing a few here, but for example, um, many literacy programs will contract with an organization called Pro Literacy and provide pro literacy training. Doug, is that something you're familiar with? Uh, no. No? Okay, I was curious. No. Uh, but a lot of organizations uh, will have that support from, from Pro Literacy and they do some good um, training of that type for volunteers. Um, some people come with TESOL certifications. Um, and I'll go ahead and add with Verva in the room, she reminds me um, also with, with whole education certificate degrees, right? Education degrees that um, prepare them to teach in the public schools. Um, and so they may have some combination of those. Um, some of these certifications come through universities. Others are private, like the so-called CELTA certificate, maybe the School for International Training. And there, there are literally hundreds of others um, so just wanted to kind of touch on the fact that the word TESOL certificate is not one thing, but rather many different things that require um, some, some knowledge of where they come from. Um, some teachers come professionally trained. Maybe they have a master's or a PhD in linguistics. Uh, maybe it's applied linguistics. Maybe uh, a master's in TESOL, teaching English to speakers of other languages. And then finally, there, there are many who are specially trained within a given private school system. Maybe there's a method. Um, there's one here in Washington, D.C. called the Lotto School. They have their own certificate that basically trains teachers to teach the way they want. Okay. Um, so can we just go back through the room? Does this help describe the teachers in your program? And what else should we add here? Well, all of our teachers are volunteer teachers. Okay. And uh, I, I think you probably already know that we we were using some ventures books and, and our our director wanted to change books so i kind of pushed them to intercambio because it has the color vowel charts in it mm -hmm. and one of the problems that i saw was that most of we have teacher turnover is probably more than we would like 
So Intercambio offers or comes with a, uh, when you join their community thing, you get a, access to their teacher training program is online. And it's it's used to train volunteer teachers. That's so right. it's not not real in depth, but it's it's certainly better than nothing and it's certainly a good introduction to uh to teaching. A lot of our teachers are retired teachers at some level, but not necessarily having anything to do with with uh um ESL. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that's an important dis um, distinction to make when looking at getting your um, volunteers trained is, do you have career changers? Do you have retirees? Do you have people with some sort of educational background? But um, my experience with volunteers is for most part, uh, they might be English, have been English teachers, um, but not TESOL or ELL teachers. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So it, you with working with volunteers, you've got people who, you know, were accountants, but just want to do something else. And, uh, you know, all the way up to people who have some sort of um, TEFL background or TESOL background. Yeah. Um, and then we'll add in there that with that comes that question of turnover. And that's actually a big influence on what makes a program a program or say a stronger program versus a, a less stable program. Um, so a, what was a strong program can become a less stable program when uh, the circumstances changes, the pay changes, or uh, maybe there's just a lot of other factors that influence people coming and going and, well, and that's going to play a role. Yeah, It took a while, but our director is really, she is really, tied in to color vowels at this point. She, she talks about them all the time and talks to the <laughs> other teachers about them, but it's taken what, four or five years, I think. Yeah. I've and been, um, yeah. and I just I just felt like I get a lot of pushback on that book, the Intercambio, because the books we used before were very heavy in grammar and and this one is not. So yeah. it's like it's like the other extreme. All the teachers think it's not enough grammar. So yeah. uh, so, but I, I wanted to get that in because it's, to me, it's, it's a way to keep the color vowels in the program. That's right. It is a great way to do that. Thanks for mentioning that, Doug. Good. Um, well, let me just say that, and, and we could have, I should have another page on materials alone, but anyway, let's just say that um, I want everyone to know, regardless of what's in the left or what's on the right, Color vowel is a pro is a way of teaching that is accessible and effective in all of these contexts, and we know this because we've done this. Um, so it's not just what we want; it's what we've seen because we've been doing this for over twenty years. Um, so that's pretty exciting, and I'd like to you know elaborate a little bit on that today. Um, my other question about program that I just I'd like to ask you all, um, if you could briefly think about this, is what. You know, we know programs need to exist and we can say, well, the program's a program because it was built and it's a program. But when I get into sort of the big P or the, the real concept of cohesive program, um, what what is it that makes your program special? And and I just like to hear that. I mean, I'm curious. It's me. It's going to be a heart based thing. Yeah. Doug, what? <laughs> No, it's me. <laughs> it's you. You make your program special. But really, like if, uh, if learn, you, I want you to think like, what do learners, maybe they don't even verbalize it, but maybe they do. Maybe they go home at the end of the night or the end of the day and they remark on something the way any one of us would remark if we, I don't know, I always like to change the context and think differently about like if we had a dance instructor, all of us who we went to dance class and this person was super effective because they... I don't know, they did this really neat thing with hand signals that we've never come across before. And these things work while we're dancing. We're able to, I don't know, I'm making this up, right? But my point is, is there something yeah. that, that you think is truly distinctive if you think about what makes your program what it is? Apart from- You mean right, not just one just teacher, what sort of right. binds the whole program yeah. together? What gives you an identity as a program? And before you answer, I, I'm actually going to use both of those things. Um, the program that I ran in New Mexico for a while, um, when I came on, I, I interviewed all kinds of people within the program. And what I came across was this, this problem, which was the students basically identified one teacher as the program. 
Mm. Everybody was basically in all the classes they didn't want to be in, waiting to get into Miss Lewis's class. And she was, you know, super prepared and super trained, and she had a lot of time on her hands. And I mean, she was a phenomenal teacher. Um, but that does not a program make. <laughs> so, so what makes a program truly uh, something that students can have a journey that progresses and and leads to a kind of success? So, I just love to know if if you happen to have an element of something in your own program. Mm. I don't know. One of the Welcome. That uh, we have in my program in Northern Virginia mm -hmm. is that um, we have a a very large um, cohort of volunteers and volunteer teachers who are very dedicated to um, our mission, and I think our mission is um, very important to them. Um, but we also provide additional student support services like student advising and um, lots of we most we primarily just do ESL classes for adult learners um, at the beginning level. And, um, you know, those classes, in addition to that, we do student advising to help set goals for them for where they want to go after us. Mm -hmm. And we have a staff that is very supportive of the students. And when we hear from our students, they say that that is the kind of thing that they really like about us, that we are really there for them and we support them through their whole journey from the staff to the teachers, to the volunteers and the paid teachers, everybody. Wonderful. Thank you, Melissa. Um, I'm actually, I added some notes while you were speaking to um, to this slide because you helped me round it out, right? So you mentioned mission, you know, having a clear mission. And this is, I assume, and you can you can turn your mic back on. Is this something, like if we were to just find a teacher in your program, what is the mission? Would they know? And, and could you tell us your mission? I don't know if they would know, but our mission is to teach uh, the basic skills of reading, listening, speaking, reading, and writing English skills to non-native English speakers to enable them to better access, um, you know, resources in the society for work and education and then to improve their lives. Beautiful, thank you. Great. And I think and with, some of them would know the mission and they have a sense of the mission, but not everybody. <laughs> yeah, well, and it's hard. Mission, mission statements, as much as we try to craft them, um, they have to continually be disseminated and trained. So sometimes we we have other things to do. And, you know, so if you get the feel of the mission, that sometimes has to be enough. And sometimes we go back and have an initiative. So um, I agree. It often will come out through the culture of the organization uh, between trainings. Um, having a highly dedicated team of instructors or volunteers, you know, I'll use that word instructor for both teachers that are paid and volunteers. Um Ongoing dedication to professional development. That's that's a big piece to many stable, robust programs. Um, just the teacher's knowledge that they have support to go about professional development in their own way or that there's a great program for it helps reduce turnover and increase a sense of program. Effective leadership, which, you know, the people in the room are the effective leaders. They're the ones that seek out new ideas. Uh, they're the ones that, that raise questions and look for answers, okay? Um, and strong student support services, which I added thanks to Melissa, so I appreciate that. Um, I wanna go back to your mission, Melissa. I'm gonna piggyback on that and use it because I think it gives us a great focus for the rest of our session. Um, my question would be is if we want to empower students, which I think it's pretty safe to say that's everybody's goal, is to empower the learners to be able to go out and manage systems um, and, and achieve certain goals that they need in their life. Um, and so the question I have is, is how effective do you feel your program is in providing learners with speaking confidence to actualize all of that great learning, the grammar, the vocabulary, the reading, the writing, um, how effectively do you feel they, well, how confident do you think they feel? And um, and is that something that seems a pain point for your students? Is that for me in particular? Sure, we can start with you. I'd love that. Oh, no, it's okay. I just thought you were asking me. I, 
I'm not quite sure I have an answer yet. So let me think a second. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, one thing, um, you know, I, th I think I have a couple of experiences myself and I'm sure we can share, but I've seen programs and I encountered my own program where the most advanced learners still didn't have what they needed. And it came up in kind of a shocking way where I offered a an extra course for the advanced students who wanted to maintain their status mm -hmm. um, in the program. And, um, and so we had a lot of fun. I was doing pronunciation. We were doing lots of fun things. And in walked the student one day, the strongest, most, most charismatic student one day. And he just pretty much fell over himself, <laughs> unable to say more than two words in a row, despite the fact that in class he was kind of relaxed and could, you know, had a sense of humor and all this stuff. He could not say in one sentence that, I'm sorry, I can't come to class today. I have a job interview. That's what he needed to say. And he could not under duress, under the stress of needing to go and wanting to be polite to me and wanting to communicate this thing, could not say it. Not for lack of the vocabulary, not for lack of grammar training. He just didn't have it ready. Mm -hmm. And that has always, that has stuck with me for a long time that in, in addition to all of the, the education and the knowledge bank that our students develop, they need practice. And so that's, you know, kind of where we're coming from is that we have a method that you can combine with your existing curriculum um, to increase the preparation that students feel about going out and using this stuff to actually navigate the systems. Um, so that's been pretty exciting I, to us. I think that's a difficult question for a lot of programs to answer, a lot of administrators, just because speaking can be the hardest thing to to assess. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, confidence is something that you can't see and you can't really test. Um, and um, it is those stress moments that bring out a student's true abilities. And um, so, you know, it, it's a hard question to answer, I think. It is. I think some of our students have, um, you know, difficulty with moving on from our program because they feel so comfortable mm -hmm. um, and they like us so much. And even though we're the lowest level, uh, beginning level program in the area, and, and then they move on to higher level programs, it's hard to convince them sometimes, which is one of the reasons we created the um, student advising program to really walk them through that process and encourage them and give them some confidence to make some steps. Um, but it's one, because we've noticed that over the years, building in lots of uh, conversational practice in our classrooms is really important for us. And it's it's become, we all know that that's something we need to have our teachers really work on with the students and um, give them a little bit of pressure sometimes in the classroom to perform under a little bit of stress without scaring them too much so that they have the chance to practice. Yeah, great. I'm, I'm gonna keep borrowing. Melissa, it's such a blessing having you here because you keep saying these little phrases that I want to then run with. <laughs> so I'm gonna use that get some practice idea um, and kind of divide it into two and talk about what we do. Um, you know, we many. How many of us have ever gone to say a conversation club or um, somewhere where you get to practice the language you're you're studying? You know, I need to practice my Spanish, so I'm going to go to you know some kind of uh, conversation moment. Um, yeah, we have we have classes. We have five different levels that we teach, but on Saturdays, about three or four years ago, I said, well, these guys need more have understand more about conversation. So now we have this class on Saturday morning where it's just an open conversation class. There's no books, there's no tests. There's no, they don't even have to sign up and register. They just show up. It's like a, we just call it an English chat. Yeah. And and we we come in, they come in with, and we talk about whatever they want to talk about. I always have something prepared in case, in case I get all the blank stares. Yeah. But uh, most of the time I don't get to my stuff because they, they come in with things to talk about, questions to ask. Right. So that would be the, the first part of the clamshell, let's say, is having a situation mm -hmm. or providing opportunities to have something to say. Uh, and there are lots of ways to do that. Mm -hmm. One of them is conversation mm -hmm. clubs. Um, the other part, though, is having a way to not just practice, 
but to practice with feedback. And that's that's really where I think we shine as far as what we do at Colorvel is we we provide a, a method for organizing spoken English, connecting it to written, um, but also of providing prioritized, clear feedback that allows the learner then to say, oh, oh, I get it. Um, can we practice it now? And yes, we have specific ways to practice, um, mm. not just practice conversing, but practice specific uh, phrases that we just used in that conversation. And we do all of this in a way that's responsive to spontaneous speech, as well as crafted lessons where we have, say, a book um, or a dialogue. But we're, we really start to shine when we, we know how to support spontaneous speech, which is kind of the cutting edge of the learner. You know, that is where they shine or don't, as, as it was with my student. Um, if their spontaneous speech isn't where it needs to be, um, then what good is all the rest? Yeah. Uh, so that's a little bit of, uh, I just, I like connecting that with what you've said there. So thank you. Um, I'd like to move a little bit into uh, some content and I appreciate, um, especially Verva and Melissa, you're new to us. So I want to provide you with some content. Um, the others in the room, Joan and Doug and, um, and Elizabeth, who I think has stepped out, uh, we're all, we've been doing this for a while. Uh, so Doug and Joan represent teachers who have been studying the color vowel approach for some time. And I want you to uh, definitely feed in as, as you see relevant, okay? Um, five things that I hope to touch on today. I, you know, we, we'd like to use our time well, and we should be finishing up at the top of the hour. Um, but it's for you to know that when you hear color vowel, um, it is referring to a visual organizer for spoken English. And I'm just going to put mine here behind me so that you know exactly when you see this thing, this is the chart. Um, we use this as a, it's a graphic organizer, essentially, but it has a lot built into it that leads into what we do with our bodies and our voices when we are teachers using the approach. The approach, which is the second here, is a highly effective method for teaching spoken English with, uh, with speaking confidence as a priority, uh, as I mentioned earlier. And so our teacher training program helps ensure that, that instructors really know how to use the chart beyond what it looks like. We often refer to what you see behind me as uh, having a, a simple, deep quality. Um, it's very simple in the way that it looks at first. And then as learners and teachers get to know it, uh, they ask really good questions that we've actually built into the visual tool. And as they ask those questions, teachers are prepared with the answers that need to come forth. Uh, so it's a very uh, wonderful dialogue that the chart provides. It's a touchstone for that dialogue between learners and teachers, okay? Um, we won't mention a lot of this today, but I want you to know uh, Blue Canoe is a third part of what we do in classrooms and in programs. It's our mobile app for English learners, and it delivers high quality practice uh, with color valve feedback. So that just like in the classroom, when they go from one level to the next in a program that's well-trained, they get the same kind of feedback from their teachers across the levels. So do they receive that feedback from Blue Canoe. Same kind of terminology, same simplicity with a prioritized kind of attitude about what am I going to correct? Um, and that's that it has AI built into it that helps us create that prioritization um, so that we're not just telling them everything that's wrong with their pronunciation, but rather the one thing that will make it much better if they uh, say that phrase again into the app, okay? Um, licensing, we may or may not get to dive deeply into it today, but I want you to know um, that licensing allows an organization to use the color valve brand. This is especially useful for uh, programs that need to advertise to get students. Um, it's it's a little bit different for nonprofits and programs that have, say, uh, government funding or foundation funding. Um, but there are some uses for it as well uh, that we could look into when when there's interest. But I do want to mention accreditation. Um, accreditation is our way of helping a program be sure that they their investment in training for teachers is well invested so that you really have an outcome uh, to create a program that consistently implements the, the color value approach, consistently reaches learners in ways that that truly affect uh, their success. They're able to, you know, to leave that program possibly earlier because they're able to manifest what they've learned in their interaction with others. Okay, so that's 
um, just to know that we've got licensing and accreditation. Um, and Jennifer here, who's in the room, you can raise your hand, Jennifer, is our main contact for anything involving training, um, volume discounts on training for schools, um, those kinds of questions will all go to Jennifer. And Jennifer will put her email in the chat, okay? So I'd like to briefly walk through these. Um, and you're welcome to use the chat to say, since Melissa and Verba, I don't, I don't know how much you already know. Um, so if you give me feedback, like I already know <laughs> something about this, it'll help. But I also don't want to skip over anything. Uh, and it's always a good reminder for all of us anyway, okay? Um, the chart you see behind me is the chart, and so is this, right? Uh, this is a black line version of the chart. Uh, each phrase represents a vowel sound. Uh, at the heart of both of those is the vowel sound. So we have green and T that would represent the sound E, which we can also represent in a single image. And that image now provides us this, this efficiency where we don't have to teach phonetic symbols or see how many of the students do or don't know phonetic symbols or which phonetic symbols in which dictionary or which textbook, uh, we can use these images along with whatever texts and dictionaries we're already using. It's a very clean addition and overlay. Um, so we, we use these to represent these sounds. Um, more significantly than vowel sounds as a topic, which is, is very tiny compared to what I really care about, <laughs> Uh, what we're really concerned with here is how English sounds. And English has this particular behavior where we make meaning with the vowel sounds. And that's not true of all languages, by the way. Um, some languages are much more consonant sensitive than English, but English cares a lot about vowel sounds. <laughs> so I can use a phrase like that, you know, English cares a lot about vowel sounds. Um, or I can use a longer sentence. I can use a longer sentence and we can start charting out how that sentence sounds by its colors. Um, what this has done on a program level, I'll go back to some of my experience working in New Mexico. Um, I had a learner come to me at the beginning of a semester who said, um, I, I asked her how she was and she said, I don't know. I think I don't belong here. This was all in Spanish, by the way. She said, I don't think I belong here. I think I'm too stupid for this program. Um, she actually said that. So hold on, sorry. She said that and that made me sad. Um, she said, I don't think I belong here. I think I'm stupid. Um, she'd been in the United States for 18 years, um, and, but she had just finished raising her kids. And so she finally had time to go to the community college for these adult ESL classes. And she said, "I yeah, I don't think I belong here. Um, I don't understand anything, she said. I said, okay, don't, you know, give it time. <laughs> it was just the new semester. And um, I had just, I had just arrived the previous semester and I recognized that the chart would really help students and teachers, you know, create a sense of community, a sense of program and progress. And so I said, don't worry. Um, I think I have a plan for you. And um, I'll just kind of zoom fast forward by three quarters of the way through the year. I saw her again in the hallway um, with enough of a chance to talk with her. And I said, how are you doing? And, and she said, oh, it's, it's a lot better now. She said, she said, I listen in color. And, um, and that made it into a, a book that I ended up writing a chapter for about adult education and what we do with the color vowel approach that this, this world where everything just sounded so much like a river of water rushing by her was suddenly this navigable, stream of speech you know she was able to catch these stressed vowel sounds and that's that's what she gained from uh from the color vowel approach um so we use these i'll just say shortly uh, we use the chart and we use the images to light up the way english behaves both for listening and for speaking okay the strategies beyond the chart are all about the instructor so you might notice i'm using my hand a lot um, it's something I do second nature now because we train teachers in these strategies, right? The use of the hand is very powerful in this method. Um, and we do this to activate parts of the brain that aren't conventionally engaged uh, when, when a lot of language teachers use a conventional approach. And that is because the conventional approach is very much often um, listen to me and repeat after me. And we'll just hope that that takes us forward. And it doesn't. Uh, and that's because the language part of the brain is actually wired to be very conservative and unchanging. It's going to govern all speech, 
first and second language with the rules of the first language. So that's what's happening here. And we work around the other parts of the brain, the, the musical, the visual, and the kinesthetic as a kind of a bypass. And we call that bypassing Broca's area right here. And it, it that can sound very technical, but really it's these very tiny channel changes where by using the body, we're actually able to reach the brain in that very moment. So very exciting stuff. Um, but I thought I'd, what, I wanted to change uh, tax and just play one small video for you to kind of get at how simple this can be. Um, and then, you know, with the idea that it becomes more complex and we go deeper into habit formation with these strategies I've just shown here. Okay. Um, in this video clip, this is uh, Liz Bigler. She's one of our sort of a master uh, user of the color vowel approach. Um, this is from a few years ago, but she's working with a middle schooler in this video. And he's about to say these three words. Um, he's a speaker of Japanese and he knows these words enough that he's able to complete this multiple choice activity that he's doing. And he does it well. And yet when you listen to him, you'll you'll know that he doesn't know these words in their spoken form yet. Um, and so listen to what Liz does to, to nudge him in the right direction without actually correcting him. Um, he corrects himself. Here we go. And I'm just going to stop here to double check that my audio settings are correct. There we go. All right. And she could hear the impotence in her voice downstairs. Okay. What if I tell you that this word is gray day? Gray day? Mm hmm. Impatience. Impay yeah. She couldn't believe this many people were here to see her. She was a no nobis. Nobis. Which one? No bice. Okay, I'm going to tell you that it's an olive sock word. Mm. Olive sock. Olive sock. No bice. That's right. Mm -hmm. Most new performers never had this large of a uh, crowd. What's this word? Crowd. That word is brown cow. Crown. Yep. That's a pretty powerful clip. And, um, you know, I know others have seen this, but Melissa or Verva, any reactions that you'd like to share with that? Uh, yeah, no, I think that's really great. Um, I love seeing that. And it's really um, rather, like you said, rather than just correcting them and having them say and repeat it they're figuring it out for themselves based on their their experience with with the sounds from the from the charts great yeah yeah they're able to say and implicit in that well put implicit in that is oh i thought novice was rose boat novice or white tie novice but it's not it's olive she told me so and then he applies it and makes that change okay so novice and patience and crowd uh, she uses these verbally, and that's what's neat too, is that we actually can't use uh, phonetic symbols verbally. You, they don't have names. That's kind of an odd, it's very ironic, really. <laughs> <laughs> phonetic symbols don't have names that we can say out loud. We have to write them. I just think that's kind of um, hilarious because uh, we're talking about spoken English. And so she's able to say these things, we're able to use them, and we're able to use a graphic organizer that is at the heart of the method. Uh, you know, as a program administrator, I made a thousand copies of this object for my teachers in a large scale ESL program. And after about four weeks of students using, you know, one a week uh, across all those classes, we used up those thousand <laughs> and we started, uh, we were able to do it in their notebooks from that point forward. Um, nowadays, we would use, you know, we can use Google Spreadsheet. There are lots of ways you can manifest the Color Val Organizer. But the, the discipline of using it uh, revolutionizes what students can hold on to with respect to spoken English. They suddenly know that, you know, if I'm here, we use my animations for a moment, 
that they can place these words into their organizer so that they can hold on to that learning moment and review it, right? They can go back and say, brown, cow, wow, crowd, and, and reinforce through our, the strategies that we teach teachers to use, okay? Um, I won't be using all of these right now, but I wanted to expose you to that. Um, there's a lot more we could do, but I wanted to share, uh, move into a little bit about Blue Canoe that essentially it's an app that students can start using in the classroom with teachers. Blue Canoe does offer classroom licensing options and pricing. Um, it's a suite of activities that are all marked up with ColorVal, just like what the teacher's doing in the classroom. Um, and that allows for a kind of cycling through of the chart in the classroom with, with discovery there. Students go home, they use it some more and they come back with questions and noticings. So there's a really nice connection between what you're doing in class and what you're not doing in class, uh, what you're doing afterward, okay? Um, beyond that, just a little bit about um, licensing and then we'll come up with um, licensing accreditation and question time, okay? Um, for licensing, uh, some of this may speak to you and some of this may not, but I just want to put it out there that, that, that basically we use our brand and allow our brand to be used to convey what we do um, and what the method offers. So when a school uses ColorVal, it, it's a little bit like putting Intel inside the computer, uh, that it adds a kind of power to the curriculum and it can be used when, uh, when recruiting students, okay? Um, it can also be used in anything that represents the publicity of the school, like a YouTube video, um, attracting students, as I mentioned, um, maybe to put it on your website to show that you are engaged in a robust program that that really knows how to do spoken English. Um, it might increase traffic that way because we promote you when you're licensed um, and that you're recognized by students. And more and more students know ColorVal because we reach we reach them globally through our, our free online class for the world and through a number of other initiatives. So learners recognize ColorVal more and more as well. Um, this is just an example. Keenan Rhodes is uh, one of our accredited licensed partners. Uh, she has a, a program and a, a school online called the Clear English Corner. Uh, just as a kind of little case study, you know, she started with us. She did her level one training. Um, she's now doing her level two practicum soon. Um, and her business continues to flourish. Okay. Um, you'll see on her website that she's got a lot of ColorVal branding there. Um, before she was doing ColorVal, she had videos that relied on phonetic symbols. Uh, it just was like one more barrier to or, or friction be between the teacher and the learner getting to each other. And now she's there online um, teaching with the ColorVal chart. So it's kind of fun to see how that looks. Um, accreditation goes hand in hand with, uh, with licensing. And this is basically a, a training and support program on a school-wide basis. Um, so it's an 18 month partner program. Uh, you can implement the ColorVal instruction across your program with our help. Uh, we provide you with a, a kind of a profile of how many teachers should be level two trained, how many should be fully level one trained, and how many can um, should be at least basics trained, which is a on-demand self-trained course uh, that we offer. Uh, so that you have this kind of portfolio that allows for some teacher turnover while at the same time having a stable base of trained teachers. And that's what what makes for program -ness, uh, when you're talking ColorVal. If you have enough people with uh, basic and say, um, you know, level one and level two training, then, then you do have uh, this instituted on a program level. And that can be pretty exciting. Um, here's an example. Uh, this is a K through 12 school here in, in Maryland, uh, the International High School at Langley Park. Um, this is a case where I kind of fold back to the question of mission. Um, their mission is empowering collaborative critical thinkers for success. Um, and of course, there's a mission statement that goes with it. But what I found phenomenal was that as we partnered together for this accreditation, um, they, we really met and they connected what we do to every aspect of their mission and their, their principles. Um, and so, I mean, these, they really, um, how can I put it? They're kind of, they're nerds about their mission and their principles. And they, they, they come back to me time and again and say, okay, I think it really fits with experiential learning. And then we develop an entire training thread around that. 
Um, so we work very closely with the school, in other words, um, meaning, you know, that's their particular uh, lens on on their educational program. And that's what we do with every school is discover what what lies here and how can we connect with that. OK. Um, and so it starts to play out in all kinds of ways. This is uh, these are just glimpses of, of that school uh, where in their Chromebooks, the students pull up. Uh, you know, the day's assignments or the objectives, and you start to see color of all images. And this allows students to be the ones who do most of the speaking in class. It's a lot like, you know, starting to be the presenter so that you're ready to present when it's time. Uh, so a lot of teacher talk goes down and learner talk increases dramatically when everybody knows that there's a good way to support that. Okay. Um, the way teachers mark up words on the whiteboard changes very tiny, but a very significant shift uh, so that it's accessible and replicable. Um, Amal is olive sock Amal, and, and this is the shorthand for that. Um, and then finally, this is just from a math classroom where they're, they're building up a vocabulary base, not just of math words, but organized by their stressed vowel sound. So equation is a gray day word because that's where the stress is on the A of equation. And we, we didn't move into that too deeply today, but, um, but that's essentially how we organize, okay? Um, in terms of if you're an administrator, you're thinking about training, professional development, our training has two components at the level one um, segment, and that is basics, which is an on-demand program uh, that you can purchase for teachers and then they complete often as a community of practice. It's great to have them in groups so they can discuss it. Um, and then we offer the live practicum as a way to finish out that certification. Uh, so this is with a live trainer like Lynn here, uh, sometimes me, sometimes someone else, right? Um, and so with that, you can have your whole team trained and we're happy to talk with you uh, to, to explore options about that, okay? Um, level one training basically provides learners, uh, teachers with what they need to know about the approach. And then um, level two training is where we go deep and actually do the practice. So this is one very large practicum, um, or not very, but essentially larger, more detailed practicum. And you can see that we have, you know, a number of, um, I think what's most remarkable is partly the sound awareness that we build in teachers. There's a lot of training so they know what they're hearing when a student struggles with speech. Um, so that's that kind of training is, is not easy to come by and it's something we really excel at. Um, I'm going to stop here and just mention that I'm sure, depending on the school you work at, and I'm thinking here of Verva, um, public schools often have non-native English speaking teachers in those schools who might be teaching math, for example, or maybe science, um, or maybe English. And a lot of times those teachers, when they discover ColorVal, they also want to receive some support and instruction. And so we do have a course uh, for non-native English speaking teachers. Uh, for Melissa, I'm thinking of you, um, you know, if you're at a, more at a community college or adult ed, um, you'll find a lot of times the content instructors close by are also, there are a number of non-native speakers who wish they felt more confident about the way they spoke. And so we we offer this course for uh, teachers. That's great. Of yeah, we, we do have, um, we have a handful of non-native English teachers, definitely, that would, that would be great for yeah, it's nice because uh, if they're eventually going to be the ones who are trained in it, they get to learn with it first. Mm -hmm. They really get their feet wet um, in that course. Okay, um, and so this is this concludes you know my presentation, and I'm very happy to stay a few more minutes. We started a little late, um, and to take questions uh, about any aspect of of what we've sort of mentioned here today. Um, Becoming a partner is one option. Um, we we know that that's kind of a deep uh, concept of a deep dive. Uh, so we do everything in between. We find, you know, just as uh, Verva mentioned earlier, you know, a teacher came to her school who knew Color Val from a conference. And that's usually our, our strongest way in is a teacher who feels passionate about it uh, will come and tell another teacher and then maybe an administrator. Um, so we have what I call toe in options where you just put your toe in the water, like with basics, that course. Um, then you can wade in with a level one certification training. Uh, it's not, it's only a four week uh, commitment. 
and then and then the level two presents kind of the deep dive um, into the method so you really know what you're doing along the way okay um so what would you like to know and and doug and joan feel free if you want to add anything along the way but i would love to hear if melissa or verva have questions Oh. So I can give you first compliments. Oh, thank you. <laughs> on yes. the on the program itself. Um, so when our uh, teacher did um a session for our um, ELL specialist group, and um, it was lovely. And for me, you can hear obviously that um, I have an accent. <laughs> so um, I loved your chart um that you have. Like it made so much sense to me, um, you know, just like being able to like organize in my mind. And um, this has been, I think, a great tool. Our district and our, I'm from Alaska right now. So, I, um, you know, we have jumped this year to the science of reading bandwagon, which of course comes with um vowel valleys, et cetera, but this is a more secondary version of it. So it has been a great tool uh, for middle and high schools so that it is not the same as what the elementary students are using. So it has made absolute sense for them. And um, I do have, um, so I have not noticed that there's an app before. So I'm very interested in the app. So what is the pricing on the app? Because I did notice I, I went in the meanwhile to check a little bit out. <laughs> but um, so, so what is like the premium package pricing for that? Yeah, that's a good question. So Blue Canoe um, is a partner and they are a separate mm -hmm. company. So I'm not going to okay. be able to answer with a number. What I okay. know is that the individual price from the app mm -hmm. store is somewhere around $49 for the year. And okay. then they, what they do for schools is volume pricing. So it's only down from there. And I think there's some pretty significant discounts. So um, I can mm -hmm. put you in touch. Uh, thanks, Jennifer. She put that in the chat. Um, the The website, if you know, you can save this chat, but Blue Canoe Learning, just add learning because there's there's a beer called Blue Canoe. So, we, <laughs> so Blue Canoe, the, the app organization is bluecanoelearning.com. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and and support exactly support at blue canoe learning.com um riley my colleague there riley uh will help you with with that question okay um so but you have an idea now of how mm -hmm. it's not higher than that okay yeah wonderful and that comes by the way with a, an instructor's dashboard so that instructors can see uh, you know how often are students using the app compared to what mm -hmm. i want mm -hmm. Um, we have a teacher in a community college who is able to use that dashboard to calculate time on practice. And then she submits that for state funding in Alabama. It's part of their formula. Um, so, you know, we're able to kind of speak to the different needs of different programs through that dashboard feature. And it's for eighth grade and up, really. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not for it. You've got to have a certain level of vocabulary and, uh, you know, uh, sort of adult experience it's it the and the interface is not really designed for young kids mm -hmm. um that said we do have materials for um do either of you work with k through somebody works with k through somebody no okay then i'll just say but our materials are are definitely accessible to adults um and one of our programs or one of our products which is a, a game um is accessible to children so we use that a lot for adult literacy and family literacy uh, to bring everybody together. Mm -hmm. Hi, Melissa. Hi. <laughs> it's oh, raining right. here, so I I had just come in and I was a mess, so <laughs> I didn't want to come on video. <laughs> oh, you look great. I can't tell. <laughs> I'm in Northern Virginia too, so I, oh, hear, okay. I hear that oh. rain out there. You know, I, I work at the English Empowerment Center. I think you're familiar with Xavier Munoz. Oh, sure. Yeah, Xavier is my uh, supervisor, yeah. and he and I, I'm the faculty support manager, and he and I have just started talking about um, using the program more extensively across our classes. Um, we have a number of teachers who have really, you know, dove into it and um, 
are using it in their classes, but it's not across the board at this point. So, um, you know, he and I have really just started chatting about this and we'll, we'll definitely be in touch, you know. Great. Oh, we'd love that, Melissa. Yeah, we've, I've trained uh, Xavier in person. I sometimes call him Javier Xavier Xavier. So (laughs) we all know he can, he can go with many different names, but um, he trained in person with us and he's been just a, a, long time champion yeah he do. really is so that'd be very exciting um it's very powerful when i mean it's obvious right when 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 teachers don't have a way to talk about spoken english they either don't talk about it because they just say it's too messy i don't do pronunciation mm-hmm. um, or they make up their own way mm-hmm. which sometimes risks you know being inaccurate um because our brain is hiding from us how we actually speak so we can have an impression and that can go kind of sideways um, or they are somewhat trained and they get very technical. And so then you've got people who are using IPA and other people who are using long and short vowels. And, you know, then now it's a mixture and learners suffer. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when, when you talk about that across the board concept, that can be pretty powerful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and that's what our accreditation program is really about is helping you build that, um, curriculum build that thread and that um, uh, that ability to have color vowel across your program and so we work with you we meet with you during the um, initial term of your accreditation um, we uh, meet with you monthly mm-hmm. um, and uh, every three months we meet with all of the partners and um, who share and uh, you know we kind of guide you along the um, route of, as Karen said, um, the optimal amount of training for your program. It, we look at each school, each institution, each organization individually to see what's going to work best, especially going back to what we talked about at the beginning, which is how many volunteers do you have? What's your turnover? And, um, you know, being able to say that you're a color vowel accredited school means that you are able to um, provide a certain level of uh, training or teaching in in spoken English at a certain level. And so we help you find the the way to do that, you know, as effectively as possible and as economically as possible. We have had a number of students in in our uh, school, I guess you call it, that after they take the first basic course or, the, or one, one or two courses in our classes, they go in to a paid place and because they think they're going to pay some money and get better to better studying, I guess. I don't know. But then a year later, they're back in my classroom because they, they really they picked up on the color valves. They went someplace else that didn't have it and, and they didn't get what they wanted. And I've had a number of them tell me that that our classes are better than what they paid for before. <laughs> our free classes are better than what they were paying for. So wow. I think there's probably a lot of schools that need to do something else. Mm-hmm. I think the color vowels, one of the things that I'm sure that it does for my students, it gives them confidence in their ability to pronounce. And that's one of the things they're always afraid of is that, they're, that, that the wrong sound is gonna come out of their mouth and that stops them from having conversations. So it's, it, it's helped a lot. It, it gives I, a strategy to, um, to be understood. So if they're not being understood, they mm-hmm. have some techniques they can try, strategies they can try to, to be better understood. Yeah. So we get past that and then we get, then we get into the areas where they, they learn how to introduce themselves or something and they, they get a response back that they didn't expect. Then, then they stop. <laughs> So it's, it's kind of they listen to me <laughs> yeah it's kind of it's kind of fun yeah um uh, our we had our uh again we we did what i think about this uh readers theater is that when you put them up in front of an audience they know they're going to be in front of an audience then then they will practice more english at home because one of the problems i have is i think the only time they practice english is when they're in my class so i i give them give them some reason. And uh, they have really taken to that. So, well, the other thing that's happened at our 
organization is we have volunteer teachers and so they don't they don't do a lot of other interaction mm -hmm. so i started doing these readers theater things and and now the other teachers are competing with me <laughs> so, so they're they're singing songs and they're doing other little skits and things at the end of the term to to compete so it's kind of interesting well and and word spreads you know that these brain-based strategies that's part of why songs are so yeah. great, so forth meaning we we also validate fun uh, because that fun often is brain-based and we can provide you know real yeah. reasons why it should be part of a curriculum or part of a program to have these kinds of culminating events um, i can show you what we did if you have an extra couple of minutes um yeah after we finish the session i'd love yeah. to do that. that'd be sure. great let me know and i'll show you what we did last week Definitely. Um, ladies, I want everybody to know uh, we do have this webinar series coming up next week um, and you can register for that. I just gave you the form as a link. Um, you can share that with your teachers. Uh, if And I'm curious, Verva and Melissa, have either both of you, uh, have you received our newsletter this in the last couple of days? Anything announcing that webinar series to you? I, I've gotten it. Okay. If you just register on that link, then you'll get the reminder and you'll get the link, the Zoom link and everything in, in time. Feel free to share your the email or even this registration form with your teachers. Um, you don't have to attend live, but you'll get access to the recorded sessions. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just a great way to kind of make professional development available. Each of those is a one and a half hour webinar. It comes with a certificate of attendance or certificate of mm -hmm access or something like that that we provide um for anyone who comes okay any question any other questions from our guest administrators today think about why you came at the beginning and did you get what you needed well i actually got more because i well i think my brain is so k-12 focused because of my job i had not even think thought about the adult education and you know while we do not do it we collaborate with our local nonprofits. so i would very much like i don't know if you're comfortable sharing like a pdf of your slides i would love to share it with them because i think this program could be something they could definitely use sure so and we actually yeah. share the recorded session and okay, okay. Um, you're welcome to I, I think both of you must be in the teachers community I'll pull that up just to make sure you know what I'm what I'm visually talking about. Um, this is where we post all of our recordings. Um, so the very same uh, notice that the event is gone now because it's now past six o'clock and I, you know, I scheduled it for that. But when you go to all, um, you'll see what's upcoming and you can go to the past. So anyway, this shows, you know, what we just did. But I when I record, I post all of those under recorded sessions. So just be sure to take a look over here. And once you see this, and I'll go out of my way to send it to you as well, but I just wanted to enable you to know where to come. Um, you can always watch it on YouTube and share it, okay? Mm -hmm. um, but we would love for you to share this with, with your adult ed program administrators in your area that you work with. Mm -hmm. um, and we'd love to talk to you about ways that you, you two, that all of you are collaborating because we're, we have a very passionate spot in parent ed and providing um, games and activities that parents can do with their children, even though they're on different trajectories. Like the parents are often on a, you know, the kids are on a reading journey where they, they're they sort of 1.5ers, they speak some English, but the reading and writing is the thing. And then the adults are on this other journey that's like, like the hesitation to speak and the, the, the speech awareness. And we bring them together with these really powerful games of ours. So mm -hmm. literacy nights, that kind of thing, okay? Good. Any other comments or takeaways as we wrap up today? This is how we finish all of our training, by the way. Um, just even one new twist on an idea. Joan, you're always here and you think a lot. Is there like a, a takeaway that something you thought about in a new way today? Like how to unmute? <laughs> <laughs> I just no. there, there you go. go. There we go. Every week, teachers get. Oh, together. I'm getting. Are you Once hearing a, a video? Sorry, I was checking something. Us. There we go. Oh, Stop. sure, sure. And yeah, I don't mean to put you on the spot. I was just, I was, oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to try this. I was just coming up with other ideas of things to include and just lesson planning ideas. That's not your your thing here and so forth. Uh, the question I would have is, um, if a person needs 12 hours of professional development, you can work something out. Like, would that be basics? 
like could they end up with like a certificate or something like that because yeah. that's what most of the teachers in our state we we just have to get these professional learning development hours and yeah they're all looking for something like that so okay right so i think you're asking um so yeah as far as that kind of pd goes um our level one training program ends up being i think we have it slated at is it 15 hours jennifer it's six and yeah a little bit over yeah because yeah. it's the the basics is is about six hours and uh and then you have uh, five sessions of hour and a half plus the practicum tasks um for so you end up with 15 or uh, 15 to 18 somewhere like that so yeah. you know mm -hmm. um depending on how you calculate them and uh, whether it's just you know session hours or if you can also count the time that you spend on tasks. So, um, and the certificate I think says 15, but we could, anytime you have one of those things, like I need to fulfill X, come to us and we will craft it so that we can make it work for you. Yeah. 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 So, and, yeah. and you can just plug into our regular, our regularly scheduled, um, uh, practicums. Um, but if you have, um, we prefer eight, but we can work with six uh, or more, but usually eight or more teachers, um, we can do uh, specialized um, cohorts that um, will uh, address particular aspects of your context, um, whether it be the, the languages that you serve, um, that, uh, or, you know, the age of your or level of your learners. Um, so we can, you know, build a cohort just for your teachers and schedule it at a time that's convenient for them and you. So, all right, just let us know what your needs are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Most of all, know that Jennifer is, as am I, but Jennifer in particular is always, <laughs> um, she's there to answer questions. Um, that customer support at colorvel.com is the way to reach her. Uh, she and I work together constantly to put together, you know, responsive programming for programs. Yeah. So let us know what you need and we'll be working with you. We'd love to. If you need quotes for materials or training to get started, we can do that. Um, I put in the chat the link to schedule an appointment if you need to, um, to talk about what kind of a training program you want to build. Um, if you want to talk about accreditation or licensing or anything like that, so. Great. Great. Any other takeaways before we say goodbye? I want to thank you for your time and your energy on a late Friday night. It's rainy and cold <laughs> and I don't know what it's like in Alaska, Verva, but uh, uh, over here, you know, we, uh, or who's, wait, who's in Alaska? It's Verva, right? Perfect. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's maybe it's still light out, but, um, but either way you've, you've sacrificed some time to be with us. And I really appreciate that. Um, please keep in touch and we'll be talking to you soon. Thank you Thanks, very everybody. much. For the session. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye-bye. So if you want to see my video, I'll show you. Sure. I'm going to hit stop record and anyone okay. can stay.